we're going to start with our fourth and final panel of the day. Obviously, we're running a bit late at this point, uh, so we'll cut a little bit into our the reception with coffee, as Hawk was saying, uh, right before the keynote. Um, so, but we will be about maybe 20 minutes behind schedule in total. Um, I actually sneakily asked uh, Matt if I could introduce this panel for some shameless self-promotion, um, not of my own, but of my organizers, co-organizers. Um, hmm. That's supposed to go on. What's happening? Ah, ah, ah. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. So for those who don't know, this person standing to my right has compiled the world's most incredible syllabus on supply chains. And a lot of people know this about Matt, but uh, for those who don't, I just want to make it very clear that this is like one of the best resources to go to on supply chains. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a quick little scroll through of the site. So basically, it's like everything, anything and everything about supply chains is here. Um, it's a phenomenal compilation of work and a phenomenal resource for um, practitioners of all sorts. So I'm going to keep scrolling as I babble, just so you can see how great this is. Um, and this is, this is part of the source of this conference as well comes from uh, this work. So. I will say, if you don't see your favorite thing on there, just let me know. And he'll put it right on. Can you believe that? Oh. Incredible. Tweet him, email him, whatever it is. So um, beyond being a, a fantastic scholar of supply chains himself, uh, he has this incredible resource that is for everyone's use. OK, so we're going to get started with our fourth panel. Um, and I'll introduce briefly, and we'll, and we'll move on. So it's called Unseen Ecologies. Um, and our panelists are Patrick Brody. Uh, his talk is Climate Extraction and the Supply Chains of Data, Decoding the Irish Data Center Phenomenon. Martabel Wasserman, whose talk is Beneath the Asphalt, the Beach, Mapping the Port and Alternative Futures. We have Netta Alexander from Dust Till Drone, Roomba, the Military Industrial Complex, and the necropolitics of dust. And Juan Yamas Rodriguez talking about border ecologies and the illicit supply chain. And a reminder, I'm going to give time signals, five minutes, one minute, and time. Hi. Um, so to start, I want to thank the conference organizers. This has been really amazing so far, and um, feel really humbled to be, you know, speaking in the same forum as a lot of uh, the people that are here and that uh, are yet to speak. Um, okay. So the Republic of Ireland has seen a recent influx of data center development by some of. <laughs> That's fine. Um, by some of the largest data co-location providers and high-tech companies in the world. Um, it's frequently listed as a prime location for data centers, uh, a distinction that the Irish government is really striving to maintain uh, because of its energy and connectivity infrastructure, low corporate tax rate, and climate, kind of the holy trinity of data center uh, development. Um, and this boom is primed at the moment to continue with recent estimates uh, slating cumulative data center investment to near 9 billion euro by 2021. And it's been posed across data center discourse as a kind of strategic node in this more global economy of data centers. And the conditions generated by this new glut of data centers are uh, leading to you know, a variety of kind of uh, cross-border projects around energy and infrastructure that I'll go into a little bit later. Um, so Ireland's creative economy has been centered around uh, FDI and the tech and financial services sector since the rapid growth of the Celtic Tiger. And data centers would appear on the surface to be a continuation of these development strategies, which have arguably only intensified since the financial crisis. Um, this paper will not be a history of the data center phenomenon specifically, as it's been referred to in the Irish press. What it will offer, though, is a critical analysis of the methods by which cloud infrastructure and finance capital are bundled and naturalized in a given territorial context using an array of governmental and discursive strategies, particularly across the networks of trade, finance, and infrastructure built between nations and in negotiation with trans and supranational formations. Um, as borders multiply across geopolitical contexts as well as across everyday life in the age of finance capital, drawing from uh, Sandra Mazadra and Brett Nielsen's idea of border as a method, um, Tech companies plan infrastructures in negotiation with state needs across avenues of friction and resistance. 
uh, strengthening their functional operation and expanding their extractive power. Capitalist forms of extraction are fundamentally restructured, innovated, and dynamized under these current circular, circulatory conditions of the global economy and the geo-economic calculations of state and corporate actors, especially as massive amounts of computer, financial, and other data become raw material for value extraction. As uh, on the taxi in Dubai, uh, data is the new oil. I think that's really, really funny. Um, so while resource extraction remains the kind of crucial link in global supply chains, capital's center of gravity has shifted to the in-between, in-transit, and ungovernable spaces, the air, the sea, the shores of these networks, by extracting value from their logistical management and operations. So skipping ahead already. Um, data centers require enormous amounts of energy, electricity to operate, much of which is directed towards cooling. Um, these highly controlled microclimates use local climate conditions while affecting them in collateral ways, particularly via increased energy use and the resultant emissions, um, as well as other spatial and social consequences of the you know, physical gigantic developments that are data centers. Um, many have noted Greenpeace's statistic that if the cloud were a country, it would be uh, the fifth largest in the world. Um, in Ireland alone, energy projections suggest that by 2026, 15% of the country's energy use will go towards data centers, a number that balloons to 20% on world scale projections. However, just as this is not an overview, uh, neither is the aim of this paper to parrot these well-worn statistics. Um, nonetheless, the environmental implications of such, te such technologies become more apparent as state regulation recedes and companies vie for position in a market increasingly geared towards green alternatives, what, which governing bodies incentivize to mitigate damage while encouraging economic growth. And uh, corporate websites inveterately preach energy efficiency and green energy that motivates the rhetorics of sustainability and climate responsibility. And governments emphasize the profitability of green industries in particular. Um, Alison Carruth describes the ways in which uh, industry propaganda and, quote, the green cloud image often serves to greenwash both network infrastructure and corporate America. She's talking specifically about uh, American companies. Um, whether lauded as a silver bullet for corporate sustainability or exposed as much dirtier than we think, the medium works to simplify the large, complicated, and inaccessible infrastructure that moves data around the world, end quote. Rendering the cloud green through these strategic visibility tactics serves to paint corporations as sustainable elements of an unstoppable forward movement, naturalizing their relationship of care towards future planetary ecologies. And while we can, of course, quite obviously point out Ireland's uh, convenient association with greenness and the various neo-colonial elements that uh, come to arise with that, Data centers are also not by accident uh, a site at which these forces come to cooperate and intersect. And this is the uh, plan for the Facebook data center outside of Dublin, I think. Um, so, sorry. Uh, and the highly strategic forms in which they're developed and publicized or not speaks to the particular power of them as critical infrastructures. Um, so speaking of visualizations of data centers, Jennifer Holt and Patrick Vondero tell us that such, quote, such images tell us about affordances and constraints turned into pipes and cables, about inbuilt political values and the ways the engineering of artifacts come close to engineering via law, rhetoric, and commerce. And the images also testify to the constant struggles over standards and policies intrinsic to the network economy, end quote. So by taking both a spatial and a financial focus on data centers, I hope to hone in on the implications of these broader shifts in order to determine the ways in which these particular pieces of media infrastructure as key sites of interaction between public infrastructure, private capital, local politics, and the so-called natural environment become sites of entangled sovereignties and powers as the grade of speculative gamble becomes handing environmental care over to the market. And Melinda Cooper has talked about, you know, in very specific ways how this, you know, it's already being speculated upon as a source for profit extraction, you know, the care of the environment um, in derivatives markets and, you know, kind of gambling on climate catastrophe. Um, so focusing on, the, on these physical infrastructures and what's made visible as to where our personal data is actually stored, what power governs it, and what environments it builds and then affects, whether accidentally or intentionally, uh, offer us a glimpse of, quote, where the cloud touches the ground, uh, to borrow Holt and Vondra's quote. Um, and this is particularly important because it's not just data that touches the ground in these spaces, obviously. Um, financial and state power plan these strategic landing zones around existing resources and infrastructures. Um, Irish architecture scholar uh, John McLaughlin shows us that the data center ring outside of Dublin represents both the attractiveness of the country's tax climate, but also the clustering of data centers around other critical infrastructures, most notably the M50 ring road and its surrounding data energy and data wiring. 
Um, the T50 telecom network also follows this ring um, and runs around the perimeter of Dublin. So this infrastructural bundling is key to identifying the strategic routes through which these forms of public and private op uh, partnership operate. Just as logistics companies require public roads and railways, railways as much as waterways to operate, so too do uh, private high-tech companies require and instrumentalize the energy and fiber optic resources of a given territory as much as its uh, labor resources, and in this case, its climate conditions. Um, and Mazadra and Nielsen proposed to understand extraction, you know, this extraction from uh, given environments through finance's entanglement with territory, which accounts for the concrete instantiations of how finance hits the ground, to borrow their terms, and the implications for labor, subjectivity, and spatial transformation, and the instrumentalization of existing resources, whether natural, infrastructural, or labor. Um, and in Ireland, this has taken on particular re relevance uh, recently in the case of Apple's proposed data center outside of Athenry in County Galway uh, within an industrial development authority strategic development corridor on a greenfield site, which uh, is former state forestry lands. Um, and this uh, project has seen widespread popular support in the region, uh, but it's also been held up for several years by planning appeals through the state's judicial system. Uh, centered around uh, claims of ecosystemic disruption and Apple's questionable claims about green energy usage. Uh, one of my favorite details from this uh, saga is that uh, one of the decisions was delayed because of the arrival of Hurricane Ophelia on Irish shores, which is um, an exceptionally rare occurrence and seen by most as a pretty concrete example of climate change induced weather turbulence. Um, so frustrated by the protracted planning process caused by pesky weather, judges, and objectors, and regretful that the process was outside of Apple's control, Taoiseach Leo Varadkar announced a proposed amendment of the Planning and Development Act of 2000, which would designate uh, data centers as critical infrastructure in order to fast-track planning and development of these sites and enable the planning process to work more smoothly. Um, and he even went on the kind of like, you know, diplomatic mission to Cupertino to visit uh, Tim Cook at his offices. You know, this was uh, a special trip that he made to negotiate with Tim Cook to get him to continue with this development. Um, so the messy and conflicting interests in the west of Ireland constitute a barrier that is to be overcome by deregulation, which would mean companies are not held accountable at the level of civil society nor through the judicial system, as the IDA has laid plans for preconditioned sites and will allow companies to kind of skip these planning steps in the future. Um, and just to note, these kind of special development zones or strategic development zones uh, are related to a long history of economic zoning in Ireland and semi-state kind of corporation control of these spaces. Um, you know, the Shannon Free Zone was established in 1958 and was one of the world's first experiments with these kinds of things. Um, is, and then in the 1980s, the uh, International Financial Services Center in Dublin was kind of set up as a, a special kind of tax haven uh, for European companies in, uh, in particular. Um, so with, and Ireland is obviously still kind of, still considered a tax haven by most, um, except for the European Union. Um, so with this in mind, I'll point out that these various kinds of circulations are already governed under the same state agency in Ireland, the climate and the telecommunications stuff. Um, the Department of Communications, Climate Action, and the Environment. State telecommunications development is under the same umbrella as the management and protection of natural resources, but these come into strategic cooperation as much as conflicting kinds of interests in the basic governance of how they work, how they operate, um, from the regulation of antenna to the management of natural resources. Um, thus, the apparent under-regulation of forest land, which is uh, people like Iwa Ong and others have uh, demonstrated, usually actually represents an excess of crisscrossing and kind of other sovereignties. Um, and I'm thinking about here of the uh, EU and the IMF's austerity program in Ireland, which pressured the country to privatize all of its national and uh, Quilcha, which is a semi-state forestry company, uh, forests. Um, and so while this is still kind of in, uh, in limbo, you know, like there's a series of privatizations of state forests going on, but there still are national forests. Um, but, you know, within this environment, uh, this forest outside of Athenry was acquired by Apple, although no details have actually been given about the acquisition of other, um, about the acquisition other than uh, Apple saying that the site was, was uh, uniquely attractive. Um, and I'll just kind of let the uh, next slide speak for itself a little bit. Um, the European Investment Bank is uh, really focusing on the cultural elements of why Ireland is so great to filter your money through um, and also extract from. Um, 
So within this transnational landscape, we're also seeing the growth of a highly financialized industry of investors, technicians, facilitators, planners, technocrats, and uh, you know all these all kinds of capitalists um, jumping on the cloud infrastructure uh, bandwagon. Um, and with more time, I'd kind of go into more detail about how these solution companies um, that you know go to these conferences and speak at them and everything um, are actually kind of just supply chain managers um, also, and highly financialized. Um, and also, I want to kind of go deeper at some point into the extractivist economies posed as peripheral to the centralized management of this data center's solution, solution company. You know, they put themselves at the center, you buy their services, and then they manage all the pesky, you know, contingencies of getting these things. Um, and then there's also uh, an important difference between proprietary and then co-location data centers. Like in-store would be a co-location data center provider um, or servicer. Um, but co-location actually usually masks the kind of monopolies and oligopolies um, demarcated very clearly by you know, gigantic proprietary data centers. For example, Amazon Web Services hosts for a variety of gigantic uh, you know, companies in whatever industry, in particular Netflix. Um, and Amazon Web Services is kind of the most profitable wing of uh, Amazon's, um, e like Amazon's uh, logistical empire at this point. Um, but, and I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, so while this transnational landscape is pretty familiar, um, the uh, national versions of it, the national facilitation uh, bodies, replicate the imagery and rhetoric of these uh, industrial images. Or they kind of repl replicate each other. Um, so according to Host in Ireland, a uh, industry-led initiative specifically developed to generate awareness and recognition of Ireland's benefits as an optimum location to host digital assets, um, in their words, Ireland is home to the five Ps, uh, policy, pedigree, people, power, and pipes. Um, and with this last P, I can't help but think that uh, if, just as if the state came through the pipes uh, with modern infrastructural systems, uh, so too now does the corporation. Um, so funding, zoning ordinances, taxation, and finally use all seem to operate as themselves bundles of public and private interests and finance. And in Ireland, public-private partnerships, PPPs, uh, more Ps, um, have been the favored method of infrastructural and industrial development since at least the late 1990s, as private administration of public goods has become the de facto uh, mode of economic and social development. Uh, and while again these interrelations are often accidental, modular, and disorganized, they nonetheless serve a common goal um, to further the vision of Ireland as a space ripe for capital, which comes from both Irish governmental and semi-state organizations, as much as from private interest groups and corporate propaganda. In the background, you'll see uh, a particularly alarming piece from Enterprise Ireland's Irish Advantage campaign to give you a sense of how you know, almost colonial stereotypes re-arise re as the luck of the Irish becomes the hard work, the adaptability um, of the people living there. Um, and also to bring into the conversation another booming post-crisis industry, uh, similar regressions to these kind of wild Irish uh, stereotypes uh, arise in the massive Wild Atlantic Way tourist campaign uh, through the west of Ireland, through which an array of state and private actors capitalize on the landscape, the weather, the climate conditions, extracting value from existing infrastructure, building new infrastructure and the roads and everything. Um, and then, you know, in the case of data centers, the technical resources as much as, you know, feelings, affects, and needs of those in a given place. And this manifests in, in, uh, in a case like Ath Athenry as a kind of neoliberalism from below. Um, as Veronica Gago has uh, formulated. So these uh, flexible, elastic rhythms of global trade have been described by Anna Singh as supply chain capitalism, where diverse life and labor enriches global supply chains while ensuring a subjugation to capital. And uh, Rossiter, Ned Rossiter recognizes in data centers this increasing centralization, which is also paradoxically a result of global diversity. To quote him, um, <coughs> No matter that institutions potted across the world are indeed different, the computational architecture of their operations is increasingly the same. This is a defining feature of logistical media. Low-level demands prompted by minimal parametric variation are what make the world of supply chain capitalism turn around." End quote. But this is not merely in the everyday operation of trade and the intimacies of human subjects with logistical media and its infrastructures. Um, rather, it deeply concerns the production of territory as sovereignty spreads across the communications infrastructure. Um, however, such sovereignty is not as uh, de and recentralized as Rossiter uh, posits. And kind of like it's almost determinist in some of the ways that he talks about how uh, infrastructure, you know, manages life and kind of subsumes you uh, into it in an inescapable way. 
Um, looking at the specific ways in which the territory produced by these uh, methods does not act how it's supposed to um, is an important element in the critique of data centers and their curious forms of sovereignty. Um, just look at Athenry. Um, while the at least imaginary production of their of you know data centers and uh, you know these general kind of financial and logistical circulations, um, well the at least imaginary production of their smooth space of operation, despite this heterogeneity, um, is achieved through these encounters um, and the materiality of data centers and the ways in which these logistical infrastructures operate against or with the help of contingencies within specific places testify to the very spatio-political diversity and what Mazadra and Nielsen refer to as the fog and dirt, violence and magic of borders um, that supply chain capitalism both courses through and runs aground on. And this is the site, this is the Athenry site. This is what it looks like now. Um, Apple is nowhere to be found. Um, as Rossiter himself dictates, quote, a media theory of data centers would therefore need to accommodate the apparently paradoxical situation of both differentiation by technical operation, geography, and political economy, and standardization, end quote. Um, so a non-place is thus never empty, but the production of a given kind of strategic space for an apparently boring purpose in negotiation with the fog and dirt of planning, zoning, and, co and the communities they course through and intersect on the ground. Um, as one commentator on the Athenry data center equipped, um, Apple is stuck in the mud in the fields of Athenry, referring, referring to both the uh, Irish folk song about a 19th century rebel against the famine and the, cra and the crown, and the messy contemporary politics of planning with a particular uh, nod to the bogs, to the mud of uh, the west of Ireland. And this joke headline encapsulates many of these complexities of this mess of culture, uh, history, capital, politics, struggle, and the environment entangled at the Athenry site, tying the data center, community, landscape, history of colonial oppression, current, uh, you know, perhaps neo-colonial situation, and the human and non-human social worlds, as the aspiration of global connectivity uh, for the people of Athenry sinks into the mud of the Irish bogs, the thickness of life and territory in the west of Ireland, too dense to crawl out of once immersed. Fog and dirt, clouds and mud. Um, so just to briefly conclude, I have a bunch more stuff that I would really like to say, but um, can't really get to. Um, I just want to emphasize uh, what uh, Miriam talked about yesterday in terms of financialization, logistics, and the management of crisis, um, which seems to be an operating logic of uh, capital and sovereignty more generally. Uh, if we're to return to Iowa Ong and this kind of selective strategic, selective strategic administration um, of continuous exception and this literally cloud, cloudy um, area of supply chain management. Um, because in uh, you know post Brexit, there have been a series of uh, new projects um, to connect Ireland directly to the U.S. and Europe without having to go through um, the U.K. Um, so this is a new uh, subsea cable to uh, bring the fiber optic connectivity. You know because Ireland is such a hub for data centers now, um, and then also a new energy line directly between uh, Ireland and France. Um, and then, you know, there's kind of all these issues around data sovereignty that are going to come up as well around this new border, you know, the newly, uh, um, you know, newly burned border back into uh, Ireland through the counties. Um, and then also, just finally, I want to emphasize these kind of externalities that happen because in the background there, you can see the top of the Google Data Center, and this is a foreclosed house. Um, there were a few of them when I walked through the area. Um, and the area is just filled with data centers. There's tons of these gigantic, empty industrial campuses, um, you know. And so, anyways, I'll close there on the, you know, this kind of scatter shot case studies. But thanks. Thank you so much to the conference organizers and all the participants. This has been really fantastic. Um, in 2015, containers full of decorations to celebrate the year of the ram and the Chinese calendar remained at sea as the holiday came and went. Dock workers were refusing to unload cargo as contract negotiations were at a standstill. The decorations won't be relevant again until 2027. This moment distills elements about time, labor, and environment that this paper seeks to engage with through aesthetic practices. Plastic Easter eggs, jack-o'-lantern candy pails, Mardi Gras beads, 
The accoutrement of festivities symbolize our release valve from the temporality of capitalist labor. These imported objects made of plastics will likely return to the ocean they glided across as permanent waste. The, or oh. the organizing of dock workers in this instance and others was able to temporary stall temporarily stall this cycle and demonstrate the economic and ideological necessity of major ports as well as the power of organized labor. Is that better for sound? Um, so I'm going to go with the old chestnut that we keep circling around about the annihilation of time and space and ask what aesthetic and performative strategies can we employ to reconceptualize space and time as an anti-capitalist and decolonial project. I will be discussing aspects of exhibitions I curated while working at a cultural center located on a decommissioned military base on Tongva land overlooking the port of Los Angeles. Um, and Emily's presentation did a really good job of explaining the significance of the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, in my two years working at Angels Gate Cultural Center, which is named after the entrance to the port, Angels Gate, I'm not sure why, um, my central curatorial objective was to create site-specific projects that engaged with the overlapping histories of colonialism, militarism, and capitalism that shaped the landscape on which the gallery resides. While these projects address work and working explicitly, they exist outside formal organizing in and around the port. What role does art play in imagining post-capitalist possibilities? As TJ Demos writes, to cling to some outdated notion of artistic autonomy, and I would also add academic autonomy, individualist creative freedom, or transgressive and free avant-garde identity divorced from any duty or responsibility for environmental considerations, is to advocate intentionally or not for the status quo of neoliberal exceptionalism and its destructive ecocide. So I'm operating from this place that we need to tackle these issues from whatever sphere we're in um, to slay this two-headed monster of capitalism and climate change, as I hope this presentation will make clear the wrath of this beast is articulated in ways which are always already racialized and gendered. And looking back at how these site-specific projects address time and space, three overlapping strategies emerge. The necessary mapping of the economics of the port, historically and spatially. The overlaying or juxtaposing of alternative temporalities with the time and space of, of logistics. And using performative strategies to make visible the ways in which the political architecture of space interacts with different bodies. Beneath the asphalt, the beach is a phrase translated from the graffiti of the student and worker uprisings of May 1968. Um, the first image I showed was by Latinx Los Angeles-based artist Daniel Joseph Martinez, who used the phrase in a series of posters he made for the San Juan Triennial in 2005. The phrase is both spatially and temporally provocative. The asphalt is an anthropogenic sediment referencing geology and the Anthropocene. The beach, while present, is also past and future. Before infrastructure, the beach. It echoes a contemporary political chant, whose streets, no streets, tear up the concrete. After capitalism, the beach. Can we imagine mobility without fossil fuel? What will our infrastructure look like? How will restructuring society to promote bio biodiverse flourishing change our mobility? The phrase moves from the student movement in France to colonial Puerto Rico and then adjacent to the port of Los Angeles as well as countless other sites including virtual space. Tracing this movement creates an index of political connections. The slogan calls across the decades to conjure up the next mass movement. Um, this is a poster designed by Ramike Forbes um, and it was for the 2016 exhibition I curated entitled Hold Up. Um, artists responded to the prompt, an etymologi etymological prompt. Um, sustainability comes from the Latin tender to hold, sup, up. So the ensuing phrase hold up evokes conflicting images, a pillar and a blockage. The exhibition aimed to address tensions and alliances between organized labor and environmentalism. The tension in, in many ways is a temporal one. How do we individually and collectively negotiate our material survival within capital capitalism with planetary survival? This is an everyday conundrum as we use fossil fuels to get to work, get our desperate caffeine fixes from plastic cups made by prison labor, and devote the majority of our waking energy to getting by. The word sustainability conjures green capitalism and the maintenance of our current system. 
Holding up the current system blocks the need for systemic change that is required. For the exhibition, LA-based artist Ken Ehrlich created a series of posters looking at container cranes in addition to organizing a panel discussion with Empire Logistics and LA-based group La Honda. Crane technology decreases human labor and increases the amount of cargo that can be unloaded at a given time. This has the effect of speeding up the movement of goods. The posters deconstruct different versions of the crane with theoretical quotes about the nature of global capitalism. As the first in the series states, um, uh, with the quote by Brian Ashton, by going global with its supply chains, capital is creating the opportunity for global working class struggle. In order for such struggles to succeed, we need to know how the present composition of capital works. The craft worker and the mass worker knew how the system produced commodities in their day. We need to develop such knowledge today. The po this poster is embedded with a future-oriented optim optimism anchored in the space-time of logistics itself. The global supply chain creates an opportunity for global transformation. We must visualize, represent, and educate each other about the mechanics of sites of economic power in order to confront them more precisely. I'll just go through these. Um, you can find them online if you're interested. Um, so we also had a talk with um, Empire Logistics and La Honda, um, and I just I took a lot of shit for this working within a liberal nonprofit structure, as I did for most of these projects. Um, uh, Empire Logistics explicitly address, address chokeholds and possibilities for disruption along the port's lines of distribution. Um, as the late San Pedro-born artist Alan Sakula addressed, um, this place is transpla transplanted outside the city and treated as a hyper-real model. This conversation was one attempt to make visible the economic influence of the region and the ways in which it could be challenged through direct action. This is, this is all available on Empire Logistics website as well. Um, I did not curate this project, but I worked with Michael Parker, the artist, on a series of public programming around this arch that was part of the first public art biennial in LA, current LA. Um, and he uses the arch as sort of this Roman symbol of propaganda of technological dominance. Um, and basically what he does is he makes these clay gestures of arches and then he 3D scans them and gives the scans to his students, artists, comrades, and asks them to interpret the arch in something he calls radical cartography. Um, and his vision for this uh, long-term project is that he will make them all to scale framing locations of power. And the first one was at the Port of Los Angeles. Um, we moved this to the cultural center where I worked after the run of the biennial and it was referred to with much animosity as the cardboard donut ruining the beautiful view. Um, the beautiful view of what? <laughs> These strategies of exp explicitly mapping power were always presented in conversation with an overlaying or juxtaposing of alternative temporalities um, to logistics as we know it now. For Holdup, this included works by the collective Banana and the Institute for Flying, which used your erotics and speculative fiction as opposition to capitalist time. Banana created an installation orbiting around a non-functional sculptural car, which allowed for different encounters with elements, such as a wind machine blowing up at your legs and a suggestive bag of soil labeled topper with a fisted hole in the middle. Um, pleasure was posited as an alternative to productivity. The juxtaposition of mapping um, and alternatives informed the curatorial vision for the next project I'm going to talk about, which is Coastal Border. Um, in the fall of 2017, I co-curated with Raquel Gutierrez, Coastal Slash Border, an exhibition for the Getty Institute specific Pacific Standard Time, LALA. -LA. Um, and the Getty specifically talks about creating market value and cano canonical status for overlooked works. Um, and it was, so it's an initiative across Southern California. Uh, and I was kind of curious how to counteract this through a curatorial strategy. And the solution was to create a series of performance and installation-based works, which tried to really highlight the embodied nature of this LALA connection instead of focusing on objects. Um, 
As Rebecca Schneider, a performance study scholar, writes, the chronopolitics of race and gender haunt the privileging of document over embodied act uh, sh should go without saying, but of course cannot. Um, so this is a scene from old Fort MacArthur days. Okay, sorry. There it is. Um, which takes place on the same park as Angels Gate Cultural Center at a, at a military museum. Um, and uh, I see these performances that happen for Coastal Border in direct response to these kind of reenactments. Um, Jose Munoz gave us the theorization of the horizon line as queer utopia, a space both in concept and materiality that cannot be reached in the here and now because we can never touch queerness but can feel its warm illumination of the horizon imbued with potentiality. Calling in Munoz's much beloved pre premise opens the portal that performance as an ephemeral encounter imagines what a, a queer futurity may permit. Um, in this case, coastal signifies the queer horizon where border assumes the role of the murky waters of colonial and commercial violence that is actually the coastline. The six persons show consisted entirely of first generation immigrant and queer artists. Um, and we aim to show not identity as fixed but always already shaped by space and time. Um, so this image I just wanted to po uh, post because it, um, I think sometimes we think of cyclical time is inherently anti-capitalist or radical and what these reenactments which include um, you know the selling of Nazi paraphernalia etc uh, do is show us that they aren't necessarily that. Um, the permanence of built structures especially ones that survive the passage of time within the political landscape create political architectures writes coastal border artist Danny Nyerman. Nyerman had a pivotal encounter with the machine on a research trip exploring the port of Los Angeles from a passenger boat. As a cargo ship moved towards the port, he saw, off, um, he saw something obscured to civilians. Uh, these 60-foot red, cherry red machines, the automatic straddle carriers, um, seemingly dancing between, behind a six-foot fence. Um, he saw that this was a human exclusion zone, a landscape made uh, for machines and not humans, and this greatly informed his work, Port Kappa, which translates into port layers. Port Kappa uses artimation as an aesthetic strategy to activate the political architecture of the area surrounding the port. As he writes, the idea of art omation is an effort to think about how to include an element in the performance that appears to be of a time where art, actions of any kind for that matter, is not just a human activity. Um, so this was an interactive performance that happened for one night but had a corresponding installation. So it started at this point with this giant red balloon which is sort of an analog version of the Google map. Um, this is an abandoned guard shack at Angels Gate Cultural Center with a puppet hanging in it and he consistently uses puppets as sort of a way to trace a genealogy of automation or making ourselves outside of ourselves so the puppet is a reoccurring motif. Um, there are also a lot of these kind of abstracted commodities and reflective boxes scattered throughout the landscape. Um, viewers were served layer cakes decorated in binary code. And as the sun set, someone appeared to lead people through the experience of um, walking through the landscape. So um, it involved everyone having to thin out and enter uh, an actual container. This was a, a quite a large crowd. People had to go through this container. Um, He uses mirrored surfaces in his work a lot as a strategy to kind of implicate um, the viewer in something that they might see themselves as, as having a distance from. So you walk through the container and then there was this choreographed piece around this abstractive cog, um, which was activated by the performers as they spun around it in a kind of endurance piece till they dropped with exhaustion. Um, the performance ended with the, the person who served and made, made the cakes emerging behind this old gun artillery 
uh, and singing a version of Farewell Angelina by Bob Dylan, which I highly recommend listening to the Joan Baez version. Um, it was extremely powerful, and she kind of becomes this angel of history, turning her back to the port and walking away. Um, I apologize for the image quality of these. Uh, in a photograph from a 1936 reenactment of Juan Cabrillo landing in San Pedro, we encounter a local lifeguard decked out in traditional Spanish conquistador drag surrounded by bikini-clad women. In another image from the same year, non-native locals dressed in native costumes and pose beside the Cabrillo monument that continues to guard the beach named after him. Um, Cabrillo is continuously celebrated throughout California as the first European to land there. For their coastal border performance, uh, Edgar Fabian Frias begins the, his project by wrapping the Cabrillo sta uh, statue in lace. As they walked from the statue to the sea, they were met with warning signs of the extreme toxic toxicity of the water. The cranes and ships of the port are eerily close to where predominantly families of color enjoy the, sil the sliver of sacred ocean. Um, so his project, Spider Give Us Home, is based on the structure of the annual Wichitara pilgrimage in Mexico, which is a series of four rituals. And what he did was overlay that structure onto the route traveled from the Port of Los Angeles to the Inland Empire, which is known as the Dry Port, which is where the warehouses are. Um, so he picked points along with uh, environmental activists that uh, demonstrate environmental racism in particularly concrete ways. Um, so, yes. As new warehouses are developed and asthma rates continue to rise in Edgar's hometown, uh, they seek to create lines of solidarity between their experiences as the Latinx with Wichita heritage living in Los Angeles and the current struggles over land use in Mexico. The Sacred Mountain, which the ritual uh, culminates in for the collection of peyote, was purchased for the silver mining, by, for silver mining by the First Majestic Silver Corporation of Canada. Um, so he's creating connections between different struggles. As they write, there are some things in our plane of existence that can survive capitalism. They can survive physical, economic, cultural, and spiritual dislocation. But there is a web that binds us. That web is ineffable and indestructible. As they are performing the ritual at each site, they are also having a spiritual experience that they describe as unwinding capitalist histories, in which they connect to the land before and after its current state of use. Um, and they also do kind of a social practice project where they engage individuals and groups uh, affected by the toxicity of these specific sites from the port of Los Angeles to the Inland Empire. Um, in Fossil Capital, Andreas Malm writes, the significance of that terrible destiny so often warmed of in climate change discourse is the final falling of history onto the present. We are in a temporal crisis where the past is catching up with us and the future is seemingly too far away to act structurally, albeit rapidly approaching. Um, in this present moment, teeming with environmental crisis and displacement, we must rethink space, time, and their relationship. Art can not only ask how, but where the logic of capitalist space time resides, and it is at these sites we must posit alternatives and disarm the empire's clock. Uh, hi, so thank you everyone uh, for being here and thank you for the organizers. Uh, this was such a thought provoking uh, conference uh, and I really like the idea that we started yesterday with the media history of salt and now I'm going to present the media history of dust. So I just think it's, it's nice to think about those um, visible and invisible substances together. Uh, so this short paper is actually part of a much broader historical project that maps the correlation between the techno-cultural fantasy of automation and ideologies of racism and xenophobia. 
This work traces the emergence of automated home appliances to the Cold War and to the American attempt to gain technological superiority, not only in the race for space, but also in the domestic sphere. And before I'm gonna dive into the history of the Roomba, I'm just gonna show you very quickly one archival finding, which is the spiritual um, grandfather of the Roomba from uh, 1959, uh, the Rob of Back, uh, which was first um, uh, introduced in the American National Exhibition in Russia. So bear this image in mind. Um, so today I would like to talk specifically about the automated vacuum cleaner Roomba. But within the context of this conference, I want to pose the following questions. How can we study an invisible substance? What are the supply chains of dust, if such even exist? To answer these questions, I will briefly present the discipline I called dust studies, and will then explore the multi-layer supply chain of iRobot, the American company that designed and manufactured not only the Roomba, but also military drones and landmine detection robots. And this is just an overview of the talk. As I will argue, this comparison between two wireless technologies, the Roomba and the drone, forces us to look closely at the ways dust has been weaponized and used to punish, control, and discriminate. So when we think about the Roomba, we might think about this iRobot advertisement from 2012. It features an amusing cyborg consisting of a young man whose face has been replaced by the round, black, and chubby body of the vacuum cleaner. The caption reads, and I quote, because it's very small and I don't think you can read that, I, va I once vacuumed my living room from another state. I assure you I do not have elastic super arms. I have a Roomba, and so I don't have to be on to clean my own. I robot, do you? Personally, I don't because I don't have money, but maybe some <laughs> of you do. Um, when I was watching that, when I was uh, seeing this advertisement for the first time, I thought, wow, this is magic. Being in one place while controlling another, eliminating dust with the push of a button. As an early TV commercial for Romba promise, if it's down there, we'll get it. <laughs> We can outsource the war on dust, just like America has been outsourcing the war on terror to drones. <laughs> the Roomba's imagined owner is a sophisticated global citizen roaming the world while his domestic robot roams the kitchen floor. <laughs> Both the machine and its owner are mobile, independent, and technology savvy. There is, however, another advertisement from the same campaign targeted to female consumers. <laughs> In this version, swear to God I'm not making this up, the caption reads, and I quote, I enjoy vacuuming like I enjoy being stung by a swarm of bees. I look forward to it like I look forward to a root canal. I have a Roomba, so only dust bunnies feel the pain. <coughs> well, we're not in the 1950s anymore, and yet I robot think that men travel the world while women simply try to avoid pain as much as possible. Much like the 50s ad for over vacuum cleaners, the Roomba campaign maintains that a dustless world is a pain-free world of calm and happiness. It is a world in which, as iRobot co-founder once said, us work should be a choice, not a chore. But iRobot did not invent the cultural fantasy of the clean home. The Western collective fantasy of a dustless domestic space, which was cultivated and expanded throughout the Enlightenment, is rooted in historical, political, and cultural debates around hygiene, pollution, and dirtiness. Since dust uniquely relates materiality and temporality, it is many things at the same time. As famously described by Mary Douglas, it is a metaphor for any matter out of place. It is also a medium connecting past and present while magically creating forms out of nothingness. More surprisingly, it is a weapon used by the American military during the war in Iraq and inspiring nanotechnologies such as smart dust, which I would love to talk more about during the Q&A uh, if I will have time. So there is a certain irony to the fact that while dusting has been a daily concern for women or servants, those who have been traditionally tasked with unpaid or underpaid domestic labor, the intellectual history of dust as a concept has been mostly written by white men, 
like Jacques Derrida, Michael Murder, or Joseph Onetto. Theirs is a somewhat detached analytical inquiry that bears a different temporality from the endless, repetitive, and truly exhausting nature of daily domestic labor. So we can divide dust studies into two schools of thought. The first generation, uh, Douglas, Kristeva, and Derrida, have used dust to mediate between the psychological repressed terror of liminality and death and the socially constructed threat of the object other. They were later joined by feminist scholars like Anne McClintock, Christine Ross, and Carol Stidman, who studied the racial and gender histories of the cult of domesticity. But the second generation of dust scholars, which is probably more relevant to this conference, um, has shown a growing interest in the materiality of dust, its military uses, and its environmental impact in the age of the Anthropocene. As a result, various scholarly books and essays have reread dust and waste as multi-layered concepts associated with new anxieties of invisibility, surveillance, and the global distribution of industrial waste. In this recent literature, the discussion of dust leaves behind the psychology of the subject or the gender divide of domestic labor and focuses instead on the ways dust can be used to control and shape our world. Dust can therefore help us rethink the idea of placement and displacement, which is crucial to our understanding of the supply chain. It is a substance that constantly moves from one place to the next, like a commodity no one wishes to buy. The war on dust is never ending. In fact, millions of Americans now use on-demand digital cleaning services alongside cleaning robots, robots like the Roomba. Online cleaning companies like Omglow or Andy promise their subscribers to minimize contact between them and their assigned cleaners. And I don't know if you can see that, but in the frequently asked question, one of the questions is, do I need to be on? To which the answer is obviously no, you do not need to be on. So one can simply register online, provide his or her credit card information and home address, and leave the house keys in a preset location. Even if the same cleaner ends up cleaning the house on a weekly basis, and his subscriber might never run into him or her, and it's usually her. This outsourcing of the war on dust recasts recast human cleaners as ghosts. They are as invisible as death, which they are hired to clean. Automated vacuum cleaners like the Roomba replace the dust economy of invisibility with technological fetishism. The Roomba is a technology designed to compete with an emerging gig economy in which the consumer pays for a service rather than for any particular employee. While human workers become simultaneously invisible and quantifiable, many middle and upper class consumers have long-term relationship with their beloved domestic robots. And I encourage you to Google, I love my Roomba, just because the internet is a really magical place and <laughs> you would be surprised but, by what you find out. However, uh, there's more to iRobot than the Roomba. Uh, a closer look at iRobot understudied history reveals why it is impossible to understand the development and impact of domestic robots without an analysis of the military industrial complex. Founded in 1990 by three MIT graduates, Colin Engel, Ellen Grainer, and Rodney Brooks, iRobot has been struggling to find a business model. According to tech journalist Brian Ether, and I quote, the release of Ariel, a landmine detection robot, was the birth of a new business for the company, one of the most lucrative in all of robotics. In 1998, the company scored its first DARPA contract with the American military. Like so many other robotic firms, the company was ultimately the beneficiary of wartime spending, coming of age 12 years after its formation when the US became engaged in two wars in the wake of September 11, with the company Packboot Robots being deployed en masse for recon reconnaissance missions in the cave of Afghanistan. In other words, iRobot, a much beloved American company and the market leader in, autom in automated vacuum cleaners, largely owes its existence and success to the war on terror. Engel himself described iRobot's schizophrenic blend of military and consumer robotics as follows, and I quote, it was a little weird 
working on mine and thin robots, and then my next meeting would be about vacuuming. And that felt a little bit strange, but we made it work, and the military business was quite profitable. It enabled us to learn how to manufacture, sell, and distribute these vacuuming robots. Profit, so it seems, has the magical ability to make weird or strange executive decisions more tolerable. Roomba, the cute domestic companion, could not have come to life without the economic stability achieved through the Alpha contract. Moreover, its navigation algorithms are based on the same computational system developed for landmine detection which in turn are based on randomness. It's very design, a black machine that looks like a landmine, re reveals the unconscious frame of reference of the company's engineers and designers, which ultimately work on those two different machines together at the same time. A closer look at iRobot 10K tax form filed on 2008 can help us map the global distribution and political economy of dust and I'm almost, I mean, this is almost embarrassing to use this methodology of follow the money because it's like the oldest trick in the book and it's unbelievable that it can work sometimes, but in this case, actually, it worked. So, um, so when I started reading those, those tax returns, I realized that what the company was trying to tell its investors was that it outsources the manufacturing of its consumer robots to Hong Kong, uh, to two Hong Kong-based companies employing workers in one factory in China but at the same time, the military robots are manufactured in Ohio. The language used to convey this information is quite telling. Um, our tech boot family of government and industrial product is manufactured by Gem City Engineering and Manufacturing Corporation at one plant in Dayton, Ohio. Gem City's location is particularly important as military products supplied to the US government must have the majority of their content manufactured in the United States. So the use of the term tech boot family to describe the category consisting of military drones is a desperate attempt to sterilize the language of the outsourced war on terror. Killing civilians in Afghanistan and Iraq, among them entire families, this family of unmanned weapons is manufactured in the US while the Roombas and other domestic robots are being built by Chinese employees. At the same time, Roomba advertisements depict the domestic sphere as a safe haven, a neoliberal playground where one can pursue creative desires. And I'm just gonna show um, a few seconds of this clip, and this should answer the question that was raised yesterday during the round table, which is um, how logistics sound like. So what is the sound of logistics, and I would claim that the sound of logistics is in fact the lack of sound. So while taking away the extremely obnoxious sound that the Roomba makes while cleaning the house, which is very similar to the sound that the drone makes, um, this commercial is trying to create an entirely different experience. So let's see if we're gonna have sound. Do we? Is this the maximum? Uh, I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> it's like a, it's a dissertation chapter writing itself, but um, I'm gonna let you um, think about it. Um, the insertion of Wi-Fi connected domestic robots into this sphere, the domestic sphere, is therefore a much welcome development since it enabled consumers to either dance with their machines or control their homes from afar. Pushing against this marketing jargon, the global supply chains of the Roomba and the drone enable us to shed new light on both the war on dust 
end the war on terror. In fact, they both promise full elimination of the problem, while the only thing they are capable of doing is to displace it from one place to the next. While billions are spent on chasing them around and turning the invisible into visible, these unwanted elements return with a vengeance. This creates what I wish to call the necropolitics of dust. It's a politics connecting dust and deadliness. I use the term the necropolitics of dust to expose the distinction between dust-free and dusty environment as a new form of control. Think, for example, of dusty places like the Sahara Desert, the Gaza Strip, or Afghanistan, as well as Western locations such as prison cell, inner city neighborhoods, or drug den. Tech companies, on the other hand, opt to create a dust-free environment by building clean rooms for their massive server farms. Within this new global order, the dustier a place, the more likely it is to come under attack or to endanger the lives of the already vulnerable population who occupy it. Finally, I want to briefly mention yet another supply chain invoked by the Roomba, that of domestic surveillance and the Internet of Things. The last summer, Engel told Reuters that the Wi-Fi connected Roomba 980, which is compatible with Amazon Alexa, can collect data while cleaning the house. <laughs> Despite the fact that iRobot publicly denied any intention to sell this data to a third party, a New York Times article reported that it can and might be used to deduce the owner's income level and target her accordingly. The Roomba's cuteness serves to ally our fears of pain-inducing allergies, invisible particles, and all that escapes our limited human sensorium. Paradoxically, it is the success of this, of this domestic robot that gives rise to new suspicions of constant surveillance and to perpetual anxieties of job loss and economic instability due to automation and the gig economy. In its various marketing campaigns, iRobot asks us to dance with its, in, with its machines. Perhaps we should turn away this invitation and instead take a closer look at the hidden forces that make this dance possible and alluring to begin with. And I would like to just leave us with those two questions um, for discussion if we'll have time. What can the redistribution of dust on a domestic and global scale teaches us? And how can we trace the literal and not just the metaphorical supply chains of invisible substances? To answer this question, we must get our hands dirty and come up with new dance moves, ones that are less attuned to the geography of cleanliness and capital. Thank you. Okay. Hope it doesn't fall. Sorry, I'm fighting with the Wi Fi. Okay, um, I also want to add my thanks to the organizers. Uh, this has been a great and very enriching event. Um, and I know I'm the one person standing before you in a break and some coffee and some snacks, so I, take that I don't take that responsibility lightly. Um, so today what I'm presenting are sort of the starting thoughts of what will hopefully be a new section of a longer, perhaps now life-encompassing project on trafficking tunnels um, that I've been working on for, like, but now it seems forever. Uh, but before I start, I want to mention there is a more accessible version of these slides um, at this link if anyone is um, better, prefers looking at the, on their screen rather than looking at the big screen. So I'll leave that on for just half a second so you can catch the link. All right. During the first episode of the Univision Netflix co-production El Chapo, the eponymous anti-hero is still only a young cadet 
trying to make his name for himself in the Mexican drug trafficking scene. He concocts a plan to steal the distribution rights from his rival colleagues by proving to none other than Pablo Escobar that it is faster and safer to traffic these narcotics through a tunnel under the border. The episode's climax finds El Chapo and his men rushing to lower the drug bundles into the tunnel, loading them into carts, wheeling these carts through the tunnel, and finally retrieving them at a warehouse on the U.S. side. At a key moment in this climatic sequence, an establishing shot signals that we are at the U.S.-Mexico border crossing. As the camera cranes downward, we cut through the asphalt and dirt underneath the highway onto the tunnel, where El Chapo himself is pushing the cart loaded with drug bundles. The camera then lowers further and finally cuts to a ground level angle on the tunnel, centering the tunnel's railway. In three swift formal moves, the sequence contrasts the slow north-south movement of the cars on the highway to the quick south-north movement of the tunnel carts on a railway. As the mainstream fictional narrative of the rise of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, it is not surprising that the series' first episode foregrounds the notorious kingpin's most famous symbol, the drug tunnel. What is most striking and significant for this presentation is how the episode builds tension around this structure's ability to deliver the illegal goods as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Throughout the episode's narrative, the existence of this underground corridor becomes embroiled in just-in-time logistics of the illicit drug trade, culminating in the scene I have just described. The sequence essentially makes a visual connection between the underground tunnel's function and that of the highway connecting both nations. And finally, the interior shots of the tunnel, by closing in on the rail track, um, sort of posited as a central mechanism, central mechanics and the central logic for the illicit supply chain that El Chapo's tunnel represents. In this paper, I want to follow these, follow these tunnel railways as they tell the story of the illicit supply chain. As deployed in defense and national security discourses, the illicit supply chain implots a diverse assemblage of paralegal activities undertaken by criminal organizations as a means for the delivery of reportedly illicit goods. The tunnel railway is one way that this employment takes place. As a readily identifiable marker for the transporter heavy cargo, the tunnel railway performs the semiotic translation between systems of resource extraction and factory production and to contemporary forms um, of the disaggregated network of production and circulation. The semiotic work of this infrastructural signifier lends credence to the idea of a distinct illicit supply chain and allows for the mobilization of further security practices to be deployed onto it. So here, I, I like com uh, Nicole's comment from yesterday about thinking about the imaginations of logistics and how these facilitate then the rise of new logistics practices, which then facilitate further imaginings of new logistics. It's sort of the feedback process of that. In short, I think through this issue in three parts. First, I argue that the mediation supported tunnels give shape to the notion of an illicit supply chain where the railway functions as a ready-made powerful signifier. Second, I suggest that the illicitness of the illicit supply chain is perhaps merely a question of positionality, namely the state's, soul, the state's role as arbiter of the circulation of flows. And finally, I posit that the figuration of an illicit supply chain has broader implications, particularly when these discourses uh, allied existing border ecologies, promoting national security and illicit flows at the expense of the vitality of the border region. Part one, the tunnel railway. So the broader project that I gestured uh, at where this will be a part of links the material aspects of uh, underground trafficking tunnels with the figurative, how they are rendered and circulated through popular media, state productions, and art projects. These representations both exceed their intended meanings, but also fail to fully capture the multivalent nature of these underground structures. Throughout each of the chapters, it's considered thought of as a monograph, through each of the chapters, I break apart the constitution of the underground trafficking tunnel as a media figure, thinking it through its forms, its infrastructures, its technical methods of visualization, and the social imaginings that it triggers. So why is the railway a significant infrastructure in this regard? Well, border tunnels across the U.S.-Mexico border were first tied to the Sinaloa Cartel and El Chapo Guzman. Um, the cartel would famously kidnap engineers from the Mexican state of Durango, which is known as a mining state, and then force them to design uh, tunnels to, to traffic the drugs across the border. 
So railways in some way are a practical measure. They were moving mining practices to uh, the border. But they're also a material semiotic residue of the, of the mining origins of border tunnel. I argue that as a sign, railways have now come to signify not only the extraction of ores, but also the circulation of goods, a move from systems where value extraction is uh, primarily at production to production and circulation. At the same time, this figure retains its connotations of underground mobility and its attendant fears of invisibility. If the rise of logistics in the commercial supply chain signaled the emergence of a disaggregated network of production and circulation, then I'm interested in asking how residual infrastructures participate in this reorganization, both at a material and representational level. And further, what is the function of the railway as a signifier in the imaginary of the illicit supply chain? So if supply chains can be thought of as assemblages of information, people, and infrastructures that facilitate the flow of stuff around the world, what then is an illicit supply chain? And here I draw mostly and um, sort of close read a report by Duncan Devil from the Inst Deville from the Institute of National S Strategy <laughs> Studies that argues for the conceptualization of the illicit supply chain. And this is part of a lar uh, larger dossier on called the illicit networks and national security in the age of globalization. For DeVille, the acti activities of organizations deemed criminal are best understood through supply chain logics for a number of reasons. First, it is market forces that drive the operations of these criminal networks. Second, the assemblage of people, logistics, and technologies that comprise the illicit supply chain has as its main objective the movement of goods. And finally, when secured, the nodes in this network are resilient enough that targeting any individual or group may not affect the broader network, as long as the market and its incentives remain intact. So here, DeVille is very much operating on the same definitional premises for what could be the commercial global supply chain. What is instructive about DeVille's conceptualization of the illicit supply chain is precisely that he um, has no, it, there's only an implicit supposition that this is in any way different from the illicit supply chain. He claims, for instance, that illicit agents and institutions would, will quote, adapt their activities to ensure that the supply chain is not disrupted. And that, quote, illicit supply chains tend to be secure, redundant, and resilient to disruption, end quote. Essentially, you can say the same thing for the commercial supply chain. Then the most marked instance of the illicit supply chain illicitness it's a matter of where, where the state figures among those agents in charge of securing the life of the supply chain. The question of listedness is not necessarily a question of legality since legal standing depends on being subject to state mandated laws. Listedness precedes and supersedes this. So rather, the listedness of any supply chain lies in how it figures the role of the state as not, not anymore the arbiter for the logics of circulation. If the neoliberal state takes on the crucial new role of making markets, then the illicit supply chain is illicit in its self-sufficiency. It does not depend on state reformations or geopolitical military industrial power to exist and guarantee its security. It's sporadic, contingent, and furtive. The illicit supply chain is late capitalist profit-seeking without the mediating role of the state. So if in Defer Collins' work, we learn that the supply chain security specialist often conceptualize the security of supply chains as fundamental to, if not interchangeable with national security. What DeVille's analysis reveals is that an even greater threat to the absence of the state, an even greater threat is the absence of the state in regulating both supply chain and national security. The biggest threat to national security may be the dissolution of the state. In reality, the, supply, the illicit supply chain follows the same logics as the supply chain. Thus, I am interested in how this distinction is figured. How do popular media, official state productions, and artistic reimaginings give shape to and contour this purported sort of statelessness? And as an entry into these figurations, I, want, I focus mostly on the main infrastructure that I pointed out, the tunnel railway. If we understand infrastructure as relational, what does this iconic sign of the illicit supply chain tell us about the system's valences and features? The mediation of the tunnel railway renders, that is, makes visible the illicit supply chain, casting various aspects of its affront to the state's regulatory functions. 
And so more, if I had more time, I'd be thinking about, uh, particularly in the case of El Chapo, how he's very much through the narrative constructing the, um, the aspects of speed and efficiency as intrinsic to these um, underground trafficking tunnels. But I don't have that time. Um, there's also the question of technical sophistication. So in looking at a lot of DHA, um, Department of Homeland Security productions and training manuals and training videos, they do emphasize that there are, they classify three different types of tunnels. The interconnecting, which uses sewage um, um, tubes, the rudimentary, which is literally a dug tunnel, and then the sophisticated tunnel, which is the one with railway and lights um, and so on and so forth. And they really emphasize the fact that it is a sophisticated tunnel. Um, and this fear of the technical sophistication as being producing an entirely new infrastructure um, outside of the realm of the state's um, sort of gaze. These various representations um, and different registers sort of build the cosmology of the public imaginary of tunnel railways, tunnel railways and their role in figuring the illicit supply chain. So although I don't have time to focus on these two other aspects, the one I do want to dwell on um, a bit more is the case of artistic reimaginings. So the third instance of this tracing the railways takes us into the, into the realm of border art. And here I want to focus on the exhibition Contrabando by artist Julio Cesar Morales. First shown at the Fray Norris Gallery in San Francisco, Contrabando features Morales' watercolor paintings about the illicit means of border transport, focusing primarily on a series on piñatas and tunnel drawings. These works emphasize the ordinary as the modality where illicit flows occur. They are responding to the exceptionality uh, proposed by the previous more spectacular renditions of trafficking. As Josh Kuhn argues in his review of Morales' work, these artistic renderings function as, quote, x-rays of legal economies that reveal just how impossible it is to separate one traffic flow from another, end quote. In linking the railway to those other infrastructures for circulation at the border, um, the contrabando reinforces the notion that the illicit supply chain is perhaps only a matter of perspective. In the rumor of trafficking, Diana Wong argues that the discursive work of trafficking as such serves as a master metaphor for the illicit as criminal, lumping all sorts of activities beyond, quote, the formal data collecting gaze of the state, end quote, as those things that are undesirable the undesirable underside of a globalization. While mainstream media crystallizes this master metaphor through its reporting and through popular fictions, the artistic depictions of Contrabando undo the metaphor by disassociating it from its eventualist and reinscribing it, reinscribing it in the realm of the quotidian. So the, the allusion to the railways in the, in the paintings in Morales' work draw the sophisticated tunnels or the tunnel railways not as aberrations of the global economy. They are the economy only seen from the perspective of the border. Trafficking discourse misrepresents the complexity of social and material relations of border regions. For both Wong and Morales, I'm arguing, the logics of um, ethnic affinity or historical consociality are the ones that govern the flows of goods of people at borderlands more than the logics of the modern nation state. Um, within these border logics, there is no concept of border trespass as a contravention of the nation's sovereignty. Consequently, the licit and illicit supply chains are part of the same network system that traverses and exploits the border region. Moreover, Morales' work suggests that the caves, homes, and churches, so you don't see the church um, in this case, are all linked by the railways, creating a border ecology that runs on these illicit, these illicit flows. If the difference between the illicit and illicit supply chain lies in the role of the state as regulator of flows and in the representational means to make it so, then perhaps the contrabando series suggests that it is the illicit supply chain that presents a greater threat to the ecologies of the border. So why does this matter? So if Stephen Collier and Andrew Lakoff explain that protecting critical infrastructure is concerned with identifying vulnerabilities and vital systems upon which the state is economically, technologically, and psychologically dependent, um, then the security paradigm emphasizes 
protecting vulnerabilities as these vital systems precisely as they relate to national security, or you might think of it as national security and commercial supply chain efficiency. But they're not necessarily in, interested in or tied to the functioning of the vital systems themselves, or even the region where these vital systems um, occur. And here, it, I'm only beginning to engage with this work, but uh, Kenneth Matson is doing incredible work in mapping the extent to which Homeland Security waivers, um, like the like waiving the Clean Water Act or waiving the Clean Air Act um, on the premise of it's important to national security have been sort of um, rising in the past few years and he's sort of mapping them through each one of the border states uh, where they're occurring and what are the environmental and social implications of that kind of work. At stake here then is understanding how the idea of the illicit supply chain helps mobilize security discourses and practices that directly or indirectly disturb existing border ecologies. I'm, um, yes, I'm interested in that, how the development of a security apparatus to maintain the vitality of the geopolitical state increasingly contrasts with the long-term vitality of the region where this apparatus is most forcibly enacted. Thank you.